Roman Papaduke. I'm the executive director of the George Bush Presidential Library Foundation. On behalf of the foundation, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's event uh, featuring the 20th anniversary of President George Bush's administration. It's hard to believe that 20 years ago this year, President Bush took office. And in that time, uh, many things have transpired, but I think as we look back at those years that the President was in office, we gain greater appreciation of the successes that he had both in domestic as well as in foreign policies. I think a lot of us are very much aware of his foreign policy successes. We look at the Gulf War situation, we look at the demise of the Soviet Union, the end of communism, the end of apartheid in South Africa, plus numerous other foreign policy successes. Unfortunately, not much attention has been paid to the domestic successes of the President, which are of equal scope. There was the Clean Air Act amendments, for example, the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990, which opened new horizons for Americans with disabilities. There was the transportation bill. There was a net increase of uh, acreage to wildlife refuges. Uh, there were other major uh, accomplishments, such as the 1990 budget agreement, which led to sustained economic growth during the decade of the 1990s. In view of that, the uh, foundation has decided to uh, sponsor a number of panels throughout the course of the day. This afternoon, we have two panels. One, which is currently on stage right now, focuses on economic and domestic policy. At 3.30, there will be a panel on foreign policy and trade. And tonight at 6 o'clock, there will be the President's Leadership Forum, which will once again focus on domestic policy, and in which the President himself will be present and will have a few opening remarks. So I invite you to the 3.30 session, and I also invite you to the 6 o'clock session. Those of, us, those of you who will be joining us during the course of the day, I would also like to let you know that uh, the museum will remain open after 5 o'clock today. It will be open until 10 p.m., as well as the museum gift store. So if you would like to spend some money, you're more than welcome to do so. And toward the new exhibits that are on display in the museum. Well, without further ado, as I mentioned to you, uh, the foundation is sponsoring today's events, and we're very proud to, to, in particular, highlight the president's domestic accomplishments during his time in office. I would like to also acknowledge a number of our supporters who have made these uh, panels possible today. First of all, I'd like to th thank Kay and Britt Rice for their generous support and whose name uh, uh, adorns the, uh, today's programs as the Kay and Britt Rice Lecture Series. And I'm happy to see that Kay and Britt have been able to join us here to, this afternoon, so I appreciate your being here. And <laughs> we have a number of other supporters who would like to just mention. Uh, Catherine Boyd, John Cater, Flo Creighton, the Corette Foundation, Don Powell, Joseph Werner Reed, Peter Sakia, Mel Sembler, George Strake, and Richard Zuschlag. My th thank yous to all of them for their generous support. Uh, the panel, as you can see, is, consists of five individuals. From left, from your left to your right is the first panelist is Ken Walsh. Uh, Ken is a uh, news reporter for U.S. News and World Report. During the President's administration, he covered the White House, and he will share his perspective of the domestic policy situation from the perspective of the news media. Next is Greg Petersmeyer. Greg headed the National Service Organization at the White House, which administered the Daily Points of Light Volunteerism Award. So he'll give a perspective of how the Points of Light fit into the President's philosophy in terms of governance and his commitment to volunteerism in the United States. In the center seat is Roger Porter. Roger was the man for economic and domestic policy at the White House. He ran the legislative program and worked very, very closely with President Bush on a daily basis to make sure that the legislative agenda moved smoothly and successfully. Next to Roger is David Demers. David was in charge of communications at the White House. He's the guy that put pen to paper with his speechwriters for the words that the President spoke on policy and at news conferences, and was also an advisor on overall communication strategy at the White House. Last but not least is Nick Callio. 
Uh, Nick was in the Legislative Affairs Office. He'll share his perspective on how the President inter uh, interacted with Congress and how he was able to move his legislative program through the Hill. On a personal note, I'd like to thank each and every one of the panelists for being here. I consider them all good friends. Four of them I worked very closely with uh, in the White House, and the fifth, while well, we worked together, he on one side of the fence as a reporter and I as a person at the White House, I do consider Ken a good friend after all these years. And I'm happy to say once again that they are all here. Each of the individuals will speak for 10 to 15 minutes, uh, and then we will open the floor to questions. And so without further ado, it's my great pleasure to call upon Roger. Thank you very much. Well, it's a pleasure for us as a panel to be here to share some insights and uh, experience on the economic and domestic policies of President George H.W. Bush. It's a real privilege for me to join with some colleagues whom I enjoyed working with immensely and whom I consider friends, and with uh, one of the most distinguished members of the press <coughs> who find themselves in the challenging task of trying to cover administrations objectively and I think uh, uh, all of us on the stage would, uh, would recognize Ken Walsh as one, not only of the most perceptive and insightful, but, but objective reporters that we had the opportunity of working with. I'm not gonna take a lot of time as the moderator in uh, expressing my own views before turning to each of them, but let me just um, remind us of a few things that are useful as we think about the economic and domestic policies of President Bush. It is very easy to become prisoners of the time in which we are living. And yet we're talking about an administration that began uh, 20 years ago. And so one of the things that I'm hoping uh, we can do today is to help you to recall or to be reminded of the context in which <coughs> President Bush took office in January of 1989 and the circumstances and conditions under which he operated. Now, there's always a great deal of attention that is accorded when we talk about foreign policy or economic or domestic policy in what is it that the President decided and why did he decide to do X or Y? But those who work there recognize that making decisions on what you want to do is only a very small part of what is involved in being president. Another large part is how you go about executing those, how you carry out the best of your intentions. And so we're actually very fortunate today to have the individual who had primary responsibility for much of the time in the White House for orchestrating the President's uh, relations with the Congress. The individual who had the primary responsibility throughout the four years of the Bush administration for how that strategy was communicated to the public at large. We have an individual who, uh, more than anyone else, was responsible for one of the major initiatives that the President made, uh, his National Service Initiative, and how that came about and was executed. And we have someone who uh, was there for the entire four years from the press who can provide some observations for you and insights into how this looked from the relationship, from the vantage point of the press and provide some insights on his interactions with the president and the people around him in dealing with economic and domestic policy issues. So with no further introduction for me, let's start with uh, Nick, then we'll go to Dave, uh, and uh, then to Greg, and, and finally to Ken. Thank Nick? you, Roger, and thank you, Roman. Uh, wherever he has gone off to. It's a real pleasure for me to be here. I remember 20 years ago very fondly at that time uh, I had black hair and a lot of it and a mustache 
And, you know, even more importantly, even more fondly, I remember that because at that time I thought the tarp was something you put under your sleeping bag or rake leaves onto. But uh, Roger talked about context. And I'm going to talk a lot about context in terms of the president's relation, President Bush 41's relationship with Congress. You know, he came to the office after a long uh, career in Washington, part of which it, uh, occurred in the House of Representatives. And from the time he left the House and moved onward, he kept many of his good friends in the House. You know, as you all know, he's the type of person who makes friends and keeps friends and stays in touch. So there was some notion that it was going to be an easy time for him in terms of moving things through the Congress because he could call on these personal relationships. Uh, but there were a lot of challenges, there were many issues, um, and the personalities mixed sometimes well, oftentimes not so well, frankly. It was a very highly partisan time. And I'm going to talk about uh, what occurred during that Congress, and looking back, I think you can see it more clearly now. There were, it was a time, actually a bridge time, I think, between the older Congress and the newer Congress in terms of how it operates. Uh, in any event, for political context, you have to look at pure numbers to start. Uh, President Bush took office in January of 1989 with the 101st Congress, in which the Democrats had majorities of 260 to 175 in the House of Representatives and 55 to 45 in the U.S. Senate. For the second half of his term in the 102nd Congress, uh, the numbers were even greater in terms of the Democratic majority. It was 267 to 167 in the House and 56 to 44 in the Senate. Um, when I went back to the White House for President Bush 43 and the Senate was evenly divided and Republicans had about a 20-seat majority, some people in Kent's profession were saying, why would you do this? It's going to be really tough, a rancorous election. I said, this is like a walk in the park with these kind of numbers because what those numbers meant for President Bush were that from the first day he took office, he was on defense. The Democrats were fed up. Early on, they thought they had a shot at the election. They lost the election. They had the House. They were not going to let him do anything. So there was no post-election honeymoon at all. And those majorities meant that there were really limited opportunities for success on the domestic policy front. And when you think about it, you have to look at that particular context in terms of how you evaluate success ultimately <coughs> for President Bush. <clears throat> Excuse me. As a second matter that plays into the first in terms of the Democratic majority, it was a watershed time for the Republican Party. It was the time at which the split between the old school Republicans, of which, frankly, President Bush 41 was one, uh, Bob Michael would, and Bob Dole would probably epitomize <clears throat> two of the others, and the new school Republicans. And it happened very quickly. The tensions were there. Um, a lot of people think that it didn't occur that this tension didn't arise between the old school and the new school Republicans until the budget agreement of 1990, but it was very apparent uh, earlier on than that. Uh, if you think about it, think back to the John Tower nomination. Senator Tower uh, failed to get confirmation to become Secretary of Defense. So the President nominated then Republican whip, the number two position, the person who counts the votes within the Republican conference, Dick Cheney, to be the Secretary of Defense. A race for whip ensued. This was like three weeks, four weeks after the President took office. In that race, Ed Madigan, an old school Republican ally of then minority leader Bob Michael, ran against Newt Gingrich, who was then the young firebrand, had been leading the backbenchers for some period of time. No one gave Newt a chance to win. He ends up winning the race by two votes. And <coughs> official Washington is stunned by this in terms of what it means. Uh, again, you take those two factors together, and what it meant was uh, that the president was very constrained in two ways on the domestic front. Because in order to get something done with the Democrats, we had to compromise and make trade-offs. Each one of those compromises and trade-offs angered the Republicans in the Congress and some of our activists. So it made it very difficult. It was a constant balancing act going back and forth. You can see it in issue after issue um, on which there were major accomplishments. Um, the tension was always there. The Republicans ended up unhappy. 
The Democrats might have been happier in some cases, but if you look at the issues, the interesting thing was the outside world viewed many of these issues as major successes in terms of getting things done, and I'll, I'll list them in, in a, just a little bit. Um, I'd like to begin with the minimum wage because it of all typified, um, Roger and I remember this while we were talking about it upstairs, the first thing the Democrats did to put President Bush 41 on the spot was pass an increase in the minimum wage because it drove the Republicans crazy, small business job losses, you know all the different arguments against it. They had the votes. A lot of Republicans wanted to vote against it or vote for it, but didn't. And then the President put out a veto threat. The bill passed the House and the Senate. They sent it to the President and he vetoed it. We sustained the veto. I remember standing by the elevators off the House floor where the members come off the floor, get on the elevators to go underground and go back to their offices. And the Republicans were just beating us silly, the, House, the White House lobbyists. We're not going to do this again. You can't put us in this position. You know, others, a couple are walking out. Yes, so to make a long story short, we decide we better recount our votes very quickly here because the Democrats left the floor saying after the veto vote that first thing we're going to do is pass this again and send it back to you. We didn't have the votes to sustain a veto. We made the decision we had to try to do something to minimize the damage in our view and get something done. We talked to the Republican leadership. We went to the Democrats, and we spent a long time, long nights, basically with the AFL-CIO at their offices, trying to cut a deal on an increase in the minimum wage. We accomplished that. We kept the increase down in terms of the number, and we got inserted into something that drove the Democrats crazy, a so-called training wage for teenagers, basically a sub-minimum wage. We're thinking victory, feeling pretty good. It erupts on Capitol Hill. The leadership who had been all complicit in what we were doing, basically <laughs> looking around like this. Uh, and so as a result, the Deputy Secretary of Labor and I, Rod DeArmond, had called up in front of the House Republican Conference. It's a once a week meeting of the House Republican members. And it's a little bit of a hot house. They have microphones like these up. And members, and usually it's members who aren't happy, get up to express their opinions. For over two and a half hours, we were berated by one member after another about the deal we had cut, while Bob, Michael, and Newt Gingrich sat next to us just smiling beatifically, telling me to just don't say anything, don't say anything. So of course we didn't say anything. So you figured that we, you know, the vote comes back and we're going to have all these votes against it, right? 100 and what I say, 176 House Republican members, 33 voted against it. That's just one example of how these issues went. It was repeated in a whole bunch of other issues. Um, the Clean Air Act reauthorization that I think Roman uh, mentioned. Uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act, which truly was a landmark piece of legislation. If you look, if you go back 20 years and think about people in wheelchairs and other disabled, people disabled in other ways trying to get around, it was virtually impossible to try to get into workplaces, in movie theaters, on buses. And, you know, yes, did it cost money to implement, but it was something that took a lot of guts, and it was, I think, a huge accomplishment for the president. There was also the Civil Rights Reauthorization Act, and then what was called Fast Track, a bill which gave the president negotiating authority on trade agreements and didn't allow the Congress or prohibited the Congress from trying to nitpick the agreements. Basically, the president could negotiate a bill or a trade agreement, bring it to the Congress. Of course, you were consulting with the Congress all the time, and it was subject then solely to an up or down vote. You couldn't change one provision and then another provision. Um, and he won that as well, and that was the last time President Clinton was unable to get that renewed five years later because trade, as you know, is a very difficult issue. But it was that issue in, in particular, I think, um, provided another watershed that occurred during the Bush presidency, which was the end of the true Southern Democrat. When we were counting votes, trying to get the votes to pass bills or to, start, or to sustain vetoes, we usually had somewhere between 60 and 70 Democrats on our target list that we would try to work. And we could reasonably expect on almost any given vote that people change, but the numbers remain the same. We could get 20 to 25 Democrats to vote with us. And so we had some power to stop things from happening. We had some power sometimes to get some things through. Uh, <coughs> by the time we were doing the fast track bill, it was renamed Trade Promotion Authority 10 years later in 2001. The target list of Democrats for us White House lobbyists 
was 15 to 20 Democrats, of which you could reasonably expect to maybe get three to five. And that's because of all the changes that occurred. Those um, Democrats, most of them Southern Democrats that we could go to, were no longer there. What happened was, I remember Earl Hutto once said to Gary Andres, uh, who was then the House Legislative Affairs Deputy, um, said, you know, Earl, who was one of our key votes all the time, said, uh, I don't know how you, expect, how you guys expect me to vote with you every weekend over the weekends. You guys beat my brains in back in my district. And that was because for all those people who we had a chance to get our vote because they were conservative Democrats, the Republican National Committee, the Congressional Campaign Committee, and the White House Political Affairs Office had them as targets to be in the elections. And in many cases, we did. That was a significant source of tension for us, at least in the Legislative Affairs Office. And I know for the president, because a lot of these people were his friends, and he didn't like the fact that we would ask for their votes, and then the political guys would go out and beat them up. But of course, you really couldn't stop that. And between 1990 and 2000, most of those people disappeared, which is why there's very few Democratic targets for Republican vote counters these days. Uh, I'm not going to go through the names I was, but it's irrelevant, but most of those people couldn't exist today. Uh, and the reason they couldn't is because the leadership on the Democratic and the Republican side keep a much tighter fist on the reins than they used to. People who voted with us, like um, Sonny Montgomery and Ed Jenkins, Ronnie Flippo and Orhoto, today would not be given a major committee assignment. They'd be put on some backwater committee because they would be concerned, the leadership be, would be concerned about where they might go and whether they could be committee chairmen someday. But back to context, I've talked mainly about the House, just a few words about the Senate. Um, the Senate was led by the very soft-talking, very highly partisan George Mitchell. He was very effective. And the Senate uh, basically served two purposes. One, as a graveyard for bills that we did happen to get past the House. Uh, if you remember, President Bush passed the capital gains tax cut through the very Democratic House in 1989. Thought to be impossible. We made it happen. It got buried in the Senate. A bunch of other legislation did, too. The other purpose the Senate served, to keep the context in mind, was as a rocket launching pad to take bills that the Democrats didn't really care if they became law or not, but they were meant for the President to veto to put him in a political spot to be used as campaign fodder during the next election. So in terms of mixed party <coughs> government like we had back then, you have to define and evaluate success, I think, through a different prism. And I think in terms of that, the President had a lot of success in actually getting things done. I don't think, and I'm not being defensive, I don't think he gets the credit for what was accomplished. Uh, he does get credit, however, for what he allowed not to happen. And he was able to use the veto power to stop a lot of bad things from happening. And the number, where there were 44 veto attempts, we sustained 43, which is a fabulous record. Although I'm thinking in retrospect, it would have been kind of cool if it could have been 41 out of 43 instead of 43 out of 44, <laughs> as it turned out. So, um, finally, if I may, I'm going to have to make a brief digression into foreign policy to provide a final watershed, and then I'm going to be quiet. I think the Bush 41 era uh, was when the notion that partisanship disappeared at the water's edge started to unravel. And I think the authorization for the use of force in the first Iraq war is the primary example of that. On that vote, we had all of the major committee and subcommittee chairs with us, Dan Rostenkowski, uh, Mirtha, Fasel, Torricelli, uh, you name it. We had all of the Democratic leadership of the House and Senate against us, Foley and Gephardt. All of them were against the use of force resolution. And to me, nothing forecast better what was to come in terms of both partisanship at the water's edge and in terms of how the Congress operates than what occurred in the lead up to that vote. Uh, we sent two congressional delegations, so-called CODELs, over to the Persian Gulf over Labor Day weekend 1990. There was a Senate plane and a House plane. I was on the House plane, the leader of the House delegation was Dick Gephardt. Um, there were the older committee chairs were on the plane, a couple of us White House types, actually it's just me. We had some other administration people. But at any rate, after dinner was served on that plane, all of the younger guys, 
Gephardt, Steny Hoyer, um, and all the younger Republicans as well, all split up, went their separate ways. They either went to bed, went off to read, or both. All of the older members, Democrats and Republicans, Rostenkowski, Broomfield, Michael, uh, Dingell, set up a table and played cards and drank all night and talked about the issues and what had to be done, what they ought to be trying to find out while they're there, and they just got it done. And you don't see much of that anymore. It's one of my most striking memories, and I think one of my fondest in terms of those people, because at that time, members of Congress would argue all day and go out and eat dinner and drink together at night. And it, I think, led for a lot more getting done on a lot better basis. And with that... Thank you very much. David. Well, uh, thanks to Roman, and uh, thank you all for coming today. It's always a pleasure to... Uh, come down to College Station and, and visit. I had the opportunity to spend some time with some of the students uh, in Joe Cerami's uh, uh, class uh, earlier uh, today, and uh, it's really a treat for me. Um, I think when you uh, evaluate a presidency, um, all presidents are in some ways, uh, in the way they are judged and evaluated, um, they're often defined by the a uh, combination of the historical moment at which they take on the responsibility of president and how they respond to that historical moment. And uh, to Roger's point about uh, talking a little bit about the contextual environment uh, uh, within which uh, the Bush presidency occurred, I think you can uh, look at some of the things that were happening upon his election that uh, were really sort of at the cusp of history. Um, the way the world uh, operated in a very bipolar fashion uh, with the, uh, uh, the Soviet Union uh, versus the West, uh, that was uh, undergoing some radical uh, flux. Um, uh, 41, President Bush was the last of the World War II generation. Um, and I think that had an implication for how he looked at the world and how the world looked at him. Uh, he followed a successful presidency, uh, and from my own communication standpoint, a very successful presidency as Ronald Reagan has often been called the great communicator. Uh, the president had an identity already as vice president um, that now we were in a position to um, think through and convey what he was going to be like as president. And as all of us know, the role of vice president is highly uh, different, uh, very different from the role of president. As Nick so aptly pointed out, uh, we were entering uh, a period of time where you had a Republican president <coughs> and a democratically uh, controlled Congress. Uh, to add to that, we were also on the cusp of what I would call the technological revolution. And to give you a little bit of flavor, because this is sort of the world I operate in, in terms of communications, um, there were things that we did in the 1988 campaign that were thought of as uh, remarkably um, forward-thinking communications. Uh, using all the newest in technologies, which included blast faxes to our constituencies. Uh, this, when you talk about this today, it, it sounds like you were living in the Stone Age. Um, I spent four years in the White House without sending more than five emails. And part of that was I didn't want a special prosecutor at the end of the administration to subpoena my computer. Uh, but part of that was because that wasn't the way we worked. We worked in meetings. We worked in face-to-face -face, uh, uh, conversations. And so this wave of new technologies was just starting to begin. And uh, candidly, I think uh, when you're in the White House, you are less able to um, uh, kind of uh, work with what is New, the newest technology compared to when you're on the outside. And on the outside, you had a series of political candidates who were experimenting with how the new technologies worked, and that came back to haunt us in 1992. When we won the election in 1988, uh, we were in a very delicate 
position in that it was characterized as a friendly takeover. And I ran public affairs for the transition. And it was always a fine line to walk in terms of how to use the transition as kind of the preview to the movie, and the movie being the Bush presidency. But the transition was this two-month interregnum where we had to convey who George Bush was at, and going to be as president. At the same time, we had a sitting president who was very popular, who was very uh, 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 much uh, in, the, uh, in the public consciousness. Yet there were differences between Ronald Reagan and how he looked at things and George Bush and how he looked at things. But we had to be very careful about how how we portrayed what we were going to do so that it didn't appear that it was in any way a, crit a criticism of what had happened before. Um, and so as we, I think we had a, actually a pretty successful uh, transition. And the, uh, I guess I found out I was gonna be communications director sometime in mid-December. So as I looked at how we were going to build a communications apparatus in, in the White House. I had about a month to do that, at the same time as running the public affairs of the transition. Um, and as I look back at uh, the four years, I think they were really several phases, and those phases sort of track approval ratings. That um, our first, uh, the first phase I would call uh, kind of getting our bearings and putting together a team of people and figuring out our working relationships. At the same time, you are under the microscope of the media and the public in terms of what you're going to be doing as president. Um, I, I have some sympathy for the current president and some of the stumbles that have occurred in his presidency because I think that is something that virtually every presidency goes through. Uh, if you, uh, uh, Nick mentioned the Tower uh, nomination. Uh, we were unsuccessful in, in uh, achieving the uh, uh, nomination for the Secretary of Defense. That was a big deal. And there was a lot of commentary about were we up to the task and so forth. Um, I think that happens with virtually every uh, president uh, where it's that sorting out of how the White House is going to work how you portray yourself uh, publicly. Uh, uh, we, uh, Winston Churchill once remarked, this pudding has no theme. Uh, and I would say that in our first couple of months, we had no theme. And so we were searching for our footing. And uh, the president would do a trip, and we would, uh, I remember one that I think we hit, I don't know, six states in a trip, and it was just the trip from hell. And uh, not so much because it was so arduous, but because we, we sort of lurched from one event to another. And, and I didn't quite have a handle on the speechwriting office yet. And we had brand new speechwriters and so forth. And we did an event in California in which uh, somehow the line slipped through my fingers. And we had the, uh, the president say, I want to give a high five to high tech. And it was one of the more embarrassing statements that I've ever been associated with. But it was that sort of sorting out period. And our approval ratings, as you look at approval ratings today, really were not bad. They were in the, you know, in the 50s, 60s, and we started to get traction um, when we engaged on the foreign policy field. And in my view, that was in May. It was on a trip to Europe in which um, uh, the president gave a a very ringing, inspiring speech in the town of Mainz, Germany. And even some of the reporters came up to me afterwards who had already been saying, does George Bush know how to really give a good speech? And they came up and said, OK, that was a great speech. And we started to get our, our sea legs, if you will, in that first period. Um, from about the summer of 1989, um, into uh, the body of 1990, I would say we started to hit our stride. We had the Clean Air Act uh, amendments that were uh, passed. The ADA was uh, signed in July of 1990. Uh, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait in August of early 1990. And the president's uh, approval ratings were up in the 70s at that point. Then there was a very interesting dynamic that took place. 
uh, which was uh, after uh, the month of kind of bad, kind of the summer, I think the summer, I'm not sure if they were in recess or not, in August of 1990, but we were in the middle of our off-year elections. And some of what Nick was talking about in terms of the tension between the political side and the public uh, and the, the legislative side was apparent from a message management standpoint too. Because the president wisely knew that he needed Democratic votes ultimately if we were to uh, uh, have hostilities in the Gulf. And so for the next two months, the president would go out and campaign for Republican candidates and he would talk about how we really needed uh, more Republicans in the Congress uh, to help uh, uh, block badly uh, uh, conceived Democratic initiatives or uh, to support important Republican initiatives. So, and he would give a speech in which that would be the body of the speech. But then at the end of the speech, he would stop and say, and he insisted that this would be in the speech, but now I want to just put politics aside for a moment, and I want to thank my Democratic friends in the House and Senate for standing firm with us on our uh, issues in the Gulf. And so you can imagine this mixed message. So are the Democrats good? Are the Democrats bad? And you could watch the poll numbers over those two months because of the lack of clarity of the message. The poll numbers started to slide. And by the end of the off-year elections, in which uh, we didn't fare particularly well, if I recall, um, the uh, uh, poll numbers were really uh, disturbing because the president knew that in order to get the kind of authority that he felt may be necessary for the Gulf War, he was going to need much more public support. And from November till January, we went on a very sustained and focused communications effort to build and rebuild support in public uh, for those critical votes that were going to take place in January. And over time, you could see the numbers starting to come back, and people felt that we really did have a clarity to our messaging and so forth. The Gulf War occurred, his popularity skyrocketed. Um, it was up in the uh, uh, high 80s uh, for uh, a, a period of time. And so as I kind of look back, I see kind of the getting our, our bearings, hitting our stride, the bump of the um, off-year elections, getting back to uh, the, uh, the, on the positive side through the Gulf War. And then the numbers started to slide as the economy started to sour towards the end of the year. And the, the last portion was a, the, the phase, of, if you want to call it that. It was our struggle to try to command the agenda. And we had a lot of things working against us in terms of commanding the agenda. Nick uh, uh, spoke eloquently about the challenges of the House and Senate, uh, but you had a uh, the, some of the fallout from the budget deal politically started to rear its head. Some of the conservative side of the Republican Party was uh, disenchanted. And so you had the Buchanan challenge come from the right. And we felt that we were on defense. We had a change in the chief of staff at the White House. So we had a White House staff organization that was a bit uh, at sea. At the same time, uh, Perot started making noises about uh, running for uh, uh, president. And so you had a lot of contextual environment that was diffusing the president's uh, message and competing with that message. Uh, and when you have that kind of diffusion of message out there, you're going to see that reflected in the numbers. Uh, we had a, uh, a convention that some would say was not the most successful convention. Uh, you had a candidate in terms of Bill Clinton who was, uh, had a campaign that was firing on all cylinders. People forget that President Clinton won with only 43% of the vote. Um, but uh, we felt within the White House that we just couldn't find the traction in, uh, in 1992 uh, to uh, uh, sustain the President's effort. And obviously, uh, uh, we were not successful um, at the end. Um, and in retrospect, as I look back at all this, uh, uh, and you, you look at the regard that the nation has for this president, and it is really extraordinary.
Um, I actually was on the phone today. I'm giving a speech up in Seattle, Washington, uh, in a couple of weeks uh, to uh, the Young Presidents Organization. And I'm talking to the uh, president of that group. Um, and I'm um, sitting on my cell phone in the parking lot out here. And he, he said, so you're out of town? I said, yes, I'm in, I'm in uh, Texas. I'm at the Bush uh, Library, and I'm going to be participating in a panel. And he knew that I had worked for President Bush. And uh, he said, uh, would you do me a favor? Would you just, uh, are you going to see him? And I said, yeah, I'll probably see him. He said, just tell him thank you. And uh, it was a very genuine, you know, I think that the president's regard nationally is uh, really extraordinary. And I think some of the things and the way he comported himself in the office really have stood the test, in test of time. Nick mentioned the ADA, but the actions that he took in Panama, the actions in the Gulf War, um, and just how he comported himself in the White House. Um, it was a real privilege to work for him. So thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Greg. Greg. Um, thank you, Roman. Glad to be here. It's good to be, be at the library. Um, I can pick up really where David left off about how well regarded the president uh, is um, by talking to you about the part of his presidency that I was involved in that really was very much about who he is as, as a man. Uh, today, I, I wrote these out, because my remarks, because I had a lot I wanted to share, so forgive me, but I'll, I'll kind of stick to them. Um, if you were to go into the museum today uh, on Pennsylvania Avenue, just down from the Capitol, uh, you could see and hear excerpts of inaugural addresses by presidents. And the selection from President Bush's inaugural 20 years ago and 30 days uh, back. Um, the selection they chose was about his vision of, quote, a thousand points of light and a, quote, new engagement in the lives of others, a new activism, hands-on involved, that gets the job done. We must bring in the generations, harnessing the unused talent of the elderly and the unfocused energy of the young. He spoke of all community organizations that are spread like stars throughout the nation doing good. And then he pledged, we will work hand in hand, encouraging, sometimes leading, sometimes being led, rewarding. We will work on this in the White House, in the cabinet agencies. I will go to the people and the programs that are the brighter points of light, and I will ask every member of my government to become involved. The old ideas are new again because they are not old. They're timeless. Duty, sacrifice, commitment, and a patriotism that finds its expression in taking part and pitching in. Now, why did the museum that opened many years after President Bush had left office select these passages from the President's inaugural address to put on display for visitors from America and around the world? It's true that President Bush made community volunteering, civic engagement, and social entrepreneurship hallmarks of his presidency. And new institutions were created and new legislation was enacted and I want to speak about that briefly. But I believe the reason that the museum selected this inaugural excerpt is because this beautifully evocative vision of a thousand points of light came to be seen as something deeply authentic, both about America and this particular president. By authentic for America, I mean it spoke to both the nature of many of our most serious challenges as a country and also to our capacity to confront them successfully. By authentic for President Bush, I mean it reflected with integrity who he is as a man. That means before, during, and after his presidency, and where he believes our strength and our soul and our promise as a people truly reside. Let me say a few words then about what President Bush did and continues to do and what difference it has made. Then I want to make a couple of observations about why and how he did some of these things. First, what, he, what did he do? President Bush was the first president to establish a White House Office of National Service. It was the only change he made in the White House structure at the time of his inauguration. The office largely focused on the public beyond the federal government and pursued the kind of activist movement strategy that the president called for in his inaugural. We focused first on changing people's attitudes by calling on Americans to think differently about the roles they could play in helping to solve our most serious social problems. Second, on identifying what was working in communities and spreading those ideas broadly. Third, on discovering, encouraging, and developing leaders 
from all walks of life who were leading by example and leading their organizations differently. Fourth, on reducing volunteer liability so that it would not deter people from acting on the call they heard to help others. And fifth and finally, on building supporting infrastructure that would help more people connect with meaningful opportunities to serve. As part of the needed infrastructure, two institutions were created. First, the president established the Points of Light Foundation. In the last 20 years, it has emerged as the largest organization in the world dedicated to volunteering and civic engagement. Now called the Points of Light Institute, it equips, inspires, and mobilizes people to take action that changes the world. It has merged with the hands-on network and its more than 250 local affiliates reach 80% of the nation's population. Those affiliates partner with more than 30,000 nonprofits and leverage more than $1.2 billion in human capital annually. The second institution that was created was uh, the first Commission on National and Community Service, which grew into the Corporation for National and Community Service. In fact, many people believe that the modern national service movement began with President Bush's signing the National and Community Service Act of 1990, the first national service, service learning, and volunteering legislation in American history. The act established the Commission on National and Community Service, which was the foundation upon which President Clinton later grew AmeriCorps, and President Bush 43 extended the USA Freedom Corps. The corporation, like the foundation, has had a significant impact. More than one billion volunteer hours have been generated by senior corps volunteers. Over half a million individuals have served through AmeriCorps now. And more than a million high school students participate annually in service learning initiatives. Let me speak for a moment about, the four, about four additional accomplishments that are visible, have made a difference, and should be part of a 20th anniversary celebration of President Bush. First, when President Bush left office, he picked up where he left off before becoming president, namely doing his own points of light work. The same thing he's done his whole life, which is to tirelessly support organization and individuals doing good work of all kinds. Second, President Bush joined with President Clinton on several national and international relief efforts that have saved and changed countless people's lives around the world. And by so doing, in front of our nation and the world, clearly defined the limits of partisanship. Third, some years ago, President Bush was critical to putting together the first gathering of Ameri in American history of all living presidents to focus on a single issue. Before anyone else had committed, President Bush agreed to participate in a summit in Philadelphia that eventually engaged Presidents Clinton, Carter, and Ford, and Mrs. Reagan, representing President Reagan. Governors and mayors and more than 3,000 delegates and 100, from 150 cities and communities. Its purpose was to focus on the urgent needs of children and young people. That gathering in 1997 created the America's Promise Alliance, which is today the largest partner alliance in American history, committed to providing the fundamental resources that young people need at home, in school, and in the community in order to become responsible and successful adults and engaged citizens. And fourth and finally, by so deliberately focusing on the role of service in the life of the nation, President Bush began a presidential pattern of leadership in this area that is continuing right up to today. President Bush's focus was primarily on encouraging broad-based voluntary civic engagement and social entrepreneurship. President Clinton added to the work of volunteers the work of other American citizens who, as a result of a stipend, are able to provide direct service to meet unmet educational, human service, public safety, and environmental needs. And President George W. Bush then supported eliminating improper federal barriers so that as to allow faith-based entities to compete for federal funding to the fullest opportunity permitted by law. And now a service agenda is emerging as a focus of President Obama's presidency as well. I want to just say something about why and how President Bush did some of this work uh, in this area and how it relates to the authentic America and authentic President Bush that I spoke about a minute ago. The fact is now tens of thousands 
as, as when he was inaugurated 20 years ago. Tens of thousands of neighborhoods and communities face very serious challenges in America, where severely under-resourced parents and schools are trying to prepare children and young people to be responsible and successful adults, where physical safety was a serious problem, and where many individuals struggled with addictions of one kind or another or struggled to overcome some other great challenge. President Bush spoke of these in his inaugural address. The scale of these problems was and is beyond the capacity of government alone or in combination with even a healthy econ economy to make right. What can make a difference is adding to these two forces for good the talent and energy of tens of millions of Americans of all ages acting purposefully to address these problems both as individuals and as leaders and members of organizations in every community across America. This way of thinking calls for the President of the United States to see himself not simply as the leader of the federal government, but as the leader of the nation. To lead the forces that are proportionate to the challenges we face, the President cannot simply see himself as the chief executive of the federal government. In a major speech on domestic policy in the early summer of 1991, President Bush spoke about the progress of America being the result of three engines, the engines that in the modern era we've relied on to move us forward as a nation. First, the power of a free market. Second, a competent, compassionate government. And third, the ethic of serving others, including what he called points of light. All three engines, the market, the government, and community action by individuals and organizations together are what drive America forward. President Bush understood this as no other president has in the modern era. He understood that given the needs of the nation, fully engaging and powering this third engine and harnessing the capacity of people in the nation to reach out and help one another was absolutely critical to our nation's success. So beyond what I've offered about President Bush's accomplishments, let me just close by focusing on how President Bush went about being the leader of the nation in this regard. Essentially, he did two things, and he did them in his uniquely respectful but determined but even relentless way. First, he called people, not on the phone, but with the microphone. He called on people to think differently, to see things differently, and to act differently. Then secondly, he literally told a story every day from the White House about a person who was making a difference, not only in the life of another person, but in their own life to, lives too. Here are the kinds of things he said. To everyone, he said, a simple fact in America today is that too many people are free falling through society with no prospect of landing on their feet. Most Americans understand that the key to constructive change is building relationships, not bureaucracies. He said, I challenge every American who cares about the future of this country to get involved. Find a place or an organization or even a single life where you can make a difference for someone else. He said, if you have a hammer, find a nail. He said, there's no problem in America that's not being solved somewhere. And he said, the growth and magnification of points of light must become an American mission. To the leaders, he said, I ask all Americans and all American institutions, large and small, to make service central to your life and work. I urge all business leaders to consider community service and hiring compensation and promotion decisions. I ask members of the media to remind Americans that illiteracy, drug abuse, homelessness, hunger, and other social problems have solutions. Imagine the impact if every single newspaper and magazine and television and radio station and cable system found and recognized a thousand points of light. And finally, to young people, he said, regardless of the life you're now living, there is something special about each and every one of you. Your gifts are all different. But you each have a gift that America needs, and I'm asking you to give that gift now. And he said, what all of us want out of life are two things, meaning and adventure. You can find what you're looking for in helping others, he said. If you walk this path with me, I promise you a life full of meaning and adventure. And finally, if you believe that culture is more powerful than politics, which I do, then perhaps the most important statement on this subject, beyond of the subject of points of light, that the president made relentlessly as president and makes relentlessly up till today, 
is that, quote, from now on in America, any definition of a successful life must include serving others. Now, to make manifest these ideas, to define exactly what he meant by points of light, he told a story every day from the White House. This public storytelling occurred from November 22, 1989, until the last day he was in office on January 20, 1993. A total of 1,020 individuals or groups were formally recognized as daily points of light from the White House and were formally thanked by the President of the United States on behalf of the nation. This relentless storytelling was the first daily recognition program by a president in American history. So let me close with this. A few days before he departed office, President Bush issued a report to the nation on the Points of Light movement. In the cover letter of the report, the president said the following, Points of Light are the soul of America. They are ordinary people who reach beyond themselves to touch the lives of those in need, bringing hope and opportunity, care and friendship. By giving so generously of themselves, these remarkable individuals show us not only what is best in our heritage, but what all of us are called to become. During the last four years, much energy has been devoted to encouraging, supporting, enlarging, and multiplying points of light. He closed by saying, I am convinced that the efforts of points of light are the source of our country's greatness. They are the promise of America's future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, again, uh, as uh, we've all said, it's, it's wonderful to be here. I've given a number of talks here, and I always uh, enjoy coming down to the Bush Library and talking to folks, and I learn as much here as I impart, I believe. But uh, um, one uh, thing I wanted to start off with is Roman didn't mention one key part of my own background in that I'm the reporter who broke the broccoli story. Remember that one? <laughs> That's the story about how President Bush banned broccoli from Air Force One. <laughs> well. Uh, I remember hearing about that. He was on the plane, and people brought him lunch, and he had broccoli on the plate. And he said, you know, I've hated broccoli since I was a little boy. My mother made me eat broccoli, and I'm president of the United States now, and I'm not going to eat broccoli anymore. And I thought that story would last three days. It went on for weeks, months. Remember when the broccoli growers of California sent three tons of broccoli by truck to the White House to protest, and Barbara went out on the lawn holding a bouquet of broccoli, and said, I want to tell the children of America that in this case, don't listen to the president, eat your vegetables. <laughs> well, I mention this because it was the kind of personalizing story, the kind of humanizing story that showed sort of a sense of humor and a sense of sort of um, a down-to-earth quality that I think wasn't conveyed enough by President Bush. A lot of us who knew him and Nick and, and um, Dave and Roger and Greg were talking about his personal relationships. Well, a lot of us had them with him in the press corps. A lot of us knew him as vice president. And I've covered five presidents now, um, the end of Reagan, Bush 41, Clinton, Bush 43, and now Barack Obama. And people often ask me, who's the president you like the best? Well, it was President Bush 41, because he was always generous to people. He was always decent to people. And those things make a big difference. Now. Um, we're, Roger asked us to talk about sort of the context of the times, and I wanted to go into a little bit about that from the media and the perceptions point of view. Um, back in the, when President Bush was elected, uh, there was a whole different media world. You had three broadcast networks that essentially dominated coverage of the White House, uh, ABC, CBS, and NBC. After the Reagan era, where President Reagan was such a terrific communicator, having been a television and movie actor, um, there was a question when President Bush took office, how well will he communicate in this world? This was be before the rise of cable television networks. The 24-hour news cycle was just starting. Talk radio was just getting going as a, as a strong form of communication. We didn't know what bloggers were. There were no bloggers. The internet was in its, in its, in its early infancy, even pre-infancy. It was just getting going. And so uh, it was a whole different media world. So the one question in the context of the times was how Will President Bush deal with this media world at the time? And I remember talking to him initially. After I've interviewed him a number of times. And he said, well, you know, I'm never going to be as good a communicator as Ronald Reagan was. You know, I wasn't a movie actor. I wasn't a television star. So he always had this sense that he really couldn't do it as well as President Reagan. Um, he, would, uh, he went to the format of press conferences in the briefing room. 
which means a lot to us in the press corps because he would hold them once a week for quite a long time. President Reagan would hold them every few months in the East Room, the ceremonial. Remember, that's where Barack Obama just hold, held his first press conference. Um, they were very dramatic primetime events with President Reagan. Um, we'd all be um, uh, you know, getting ready for it for, for a long time. Uh, but President Bush made them more routine. And when he got to the press conferences, he'd call on every one of us. He'd stay with us until we had exhausted all of our questions because he knew the details of policy. And that's one thing that there was always a question about President Reagan. Did he know the details of policy? Well, we knew President Bush did know the details, so that was a big difference. Um, another uh, big difference was um, how much was he going to fulfill the legacy of President Reagan or divert from it or go to something different? Remember the kinder, gentler promise that he made. And so that was another sort of evaluation point. How will that work out? Um, there's, in the foreign policy, I know there's going to be a whole panel on this, but um, there was another sense that President Bush was actually, in many ways, the perfect president that the country wanted for those times. I'll come back to that in a minute. But basically, a person of experience and maturity, someone who could handle the end of the Cold War or whatever was going on in the Soviet Union and the communist empire. Now, that changed during his presidency, which again, I'll come back to. Uh, and then uh, the notion of uh, how the president interacted with us in the media. Nick talked about personal relationships. We had them with President Bush. He knew of us. He knew who we were. We always felt with President Reagan that he didn't really know the press corps, although he made it appear he did, because he was very effective in um, making it look like he was calling on people at press conferences that he knew. Well, it was, it was basically scripted. But President Bush did know us, and he did know us by name. Uh, as I said, we, a number of us had covered him as vice president. A number of us uh, had taken pains to cover and get him know, know him on the campaign. And so it was a situation where it, it was a personal relationship. And I think we prized that. And I think that served him well until the economy went sour, when no personal relationship was going to make up for the problems people were feeling in their everyday lives with the economy. But I think that was very important. And I think that the one other point I wanted to make in, in the media context was that uh, it was a breath of fresh air for a lot of us in the media, because with President Bush, we could talk to the principals who were making decisions. Partly Dave uh, helped us do that. Uh, but in the, instead of driving everything through the public relations system or a handful of policy people, we could talk to people like Roger Porter and Nick Calio and Greg Petersmeyer and Brent Scowcroft and get directly from them what the president was thinking. And that was all very helpful. And I think that's part of why President Bush, his approval rating was, was high for quite a long time. Um, so I think that's part of the context. I think that, uh, again, you'll have a panel on this this afternoon uh, after our panel on, on the foreign affairs, national security part. But I've always felt that I've never seen the White House work as well policy making in communication strategy in, uh, in working with the media as they did in the run up and the operation of the Persian Gulf War. Uh, that was, I think, uh, pretty much a model of how a White House should work in dealing with the media, in dealing with the country, and in dealing with the war itself. And I think that that could be used as a model in, in courses to explain how this is supposed to work. But on the domestic side of things, uh, frankly, on, as far as the, the end of the Bush presidency goes, uh, he did anger many conservatives by veering away from his no new taxes, read my lips, no new taxes pledge. That was a fundamental point in his presidency. Uh, Nick referred to that um, budget agreement in 1990 when it was part of, the, I think, the overall notion that President Bush was trying to do the right thing. He was trying to act responsibly. He knew the deficit was getting out of control, and so he felt that the times had changed, that he needed to change with them and work with the Democrats to get this budget bill passed. I think, in retrospect, it looks a lot better now than it did to the country then. Um, and I'll come back to that again in a moment. But um, it, that, uh, that new, no new taxes pledge did hurt him badly. A lot of conservatives felt that he had sort of broken faith with the Reagan revolution and with conservative doctrine. Uh, Pat Buchanan challenged him in the primaries. And then, of course, Ross Perot came up as the independent candidate. And uh, Ross Perot made the deficit and that whole notion of Washington being out of touch a cornerstone of his campaign. And even though polls are mixed about this, I think he, in the end, did hurt President Bush substantially with his campaign. Uh, Clinton in that election got 
Bush got 37.5 and Perot got almost 19% of the vote. An extraordinary number for an independent candidate. And so uh, the re-election didn't work out. But uh, on the positive side, I think that um, uh, the, some of the things that President Bush did on foreign policy, uh, we mentioned the Americans with Disabilities Act, the, the, the clean kind of thing that people wanted to know sort of the more personal side of President Bush. And I don't think there was, a, there, there was enough of that that got out. And uh, that's another problem. Um, I think that you, know, you remember some of the stories that sort of fed into this perception of him not being in touch. Uh, remember the supermarket scanner? There was a case where he was at a, a supermarket, uh, and they showed him a demonstration of a scanner to read barcodes on food products. The pool report, which is the report put together by the reporter on scene, because the larger press corps couldn't attend, actually got it wrong. What happened was, this was a sophisticated piece of machinery that anybody going to a grocery store would have been surprised at, because they could tear up the barcodes, throw them down on the counter, and the, and the machine could read the barcode. That's what President Bush was reacting to. It's not that he wasn't familiar with a scanner. It's that he was unfamiliar with this sophisticated piece of equipment. But that became part of a narrative that he was out of touch, which I think was unfair. Um, the, um, then there were other examples of this. But uh, basically, uh, I think um, President Bush was elected in 1988. And as I said, he seemed to be the perfect president for the times. His, the golden resume, having been vice president, director of the Central Intelligence, envoy to China, a member of the House, uh, having been in business. It was a lot of positives there and continuing the Reagan legacy. I think partly because of his success in dealing with the foreign policy issues, which were so important at that time, the end of the communist empire, which he handled very smoothly. And now I think historians give him a lot of credit for that, because it was very important not to gloat, not to, to encourage the hardliners who remained in the Kremlin to, to take on Gorbachev, not to insult the, uh, the reformers in the Soviet Union. And he did that very deftly. But as a result of him having uh, handled these international issues so well, it created the, the climate where people focused on the domestic side of things. And that opened the door for Bill Clinton to come in focusing on the economy and domestic issues. And I think so, in, in part, President Bush's success in dealing with the foreign policy issues caused those issues to recede. And that sort of laid, put in the seeds for his defeat in his reelection. Now, one thing I've, I know we want to get to some questions, so I, I'll just close with this. Um, as, um, as Roger has said, so we are often prisoners of our own times. But as time goes on, historians will be reevaluating President Bush and, and all our presidents. There was just a historian's poll released by C-SPAN, the cable network, where some very famous um, exalted historians rated our presidents. Um, the, f the top five presidents, you might have seen this, they're, they're almost always the same. Uh, you know, Lincoln, George Washington, Franklin Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, Harry Truman has not now gotten into that category. But President Bush 41 has now gone up in the ratings from 20th to 18th, 20 years later. Now, this kind of process goes on. And so I think what's happening now is historians and the country are starting to reevaluate those times, even though President Bush was unsuccessful in being reelected. And they're starting to see the things he did right, the, the, the principles and the personal things about him that stand the test of time, his decency, his commitment to principle, his responsibility and maturity. And so two decades later, I think that history is starting to give him his due. And I think that that will continue. So with that, I think we can take some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we do want, as, as Ken pointed out, to uh, permit you the opportunity to ask some questions. As you're making your way to the microphones, uh, let me just make two observations that, that have struck me as we've listened to our four very interesting panelists. The first concerns what Nick said with respect to President Bush's successful use of the presidential veto. A record of sustaining 43 out of 44 vetoes is essentially unprecedented. Many people assume that a veto strategy is essentially defensive in nature. It is to stop or block something that you are opposed to and that you don't want to happen. But I've just finished going through an examination of all of his 44 vetoes.
and of 937 statements of administration policy which he issued on pieces of legislation. And what is striking is that his vetoes fall into two categories. One are the traditional defensive vetoes. I want to stop uh, like China MFN or on abortion. But a second are what I call catalytic vetoes. That is, I want to restart the negotiations. And here is what I will accept. And when you go and look at the catalytic veto category, you discover that in the negotiations where he laid down his markers as to what he would be willing to accept, that he overwhelmingly won. And that his use of the veto was not simply to prevent things that he didn't want to happen from happening, but to serve as a bargaining tool or chit to help produce what, in fact, uh, he wanted to see produced. That is, it was a very positive element. Now, the second thing is um, we often focus more heavily on what people say than what they do. And I think one of the things that is interesting about President Bush's economic and domestic policies is not simply what was accomplished and what was enacted. And we've heard uh, of a number of things, the Clean Air Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the financial institutions, uh, savings and loan bailout, et cetera. But what happens after they are president? To what extent do the proposals that they advance disappear, fall by the wayside, or are embraced and adopted and implemented by their successors? And if you look at what happened when the Republicans were able to gain control of the Congress in 19, the, after the November 1994 elections, and see what happened in the period from 1994 to 2000 when they were negotiating with Bill Clinton over what was going to be produced. A very large part of the legislation that emerged in that time, in fact, was borrowed from or taken from or reflected what was proposed by President George H.W. Bush in an earlier period. So if you're willing to take a longer view of history, and pose the question, what influence does a president have on the life of the nation, then looking at President Bush's economic and domestic policy is very different if you take into account the skill that he had in negotiating under a very challenging set of circumstances, as Nick Calio has described for us, and the fact that subsequent to him, in the subsequent uh, four terms that we have had, a very large portion of his economic and domestic policies were ultimately brought to fruition and implemented. And I think careful his, and I think that's one of the reasons why, as Ken points out, as historians go back and look at his presidency, it is tending to rise over time because they are seeing more and more that what he was talking about and what his vision was for the country is in fact what the country needed and wanted and ultimately <coughs> came to embrace. Well, um, let's open it up for your questions um, that you may have for uh, the panelists. Seeing uh, a little hesitancy to make your way to the microphone, let me let me let me pose a uh, question to uh, David Demarest. He had a very challenging uh, task. Any communications uh, official uh, in any White House has a challenging task. Um, can you share with us a little what it was like to work with President Bush? on a speech that he was going to give, at least, at least a big enough speech that, in fact, he was going to spend time sitting down with you and, and other speech writers. And, uh, tell us a little bit about that process and how it worked. Well, I think that there were, uh, I think I'll, I'll recount two items. One goes to uh, Ken's uh, comment about stagecraft. Uh, 
that President Bush was not a fan of stagecraft. Uh, for the previous eight years, uh, a lot of the press expected a lot of stagecraft. They expected kind of a line of the day, that this was going to be very heavily a managed media <coughs> relationship. Um, and that was something that President Bush was highly uncomfortable with. And I remember a, new, a Washington Post uh, a story done by, I want to say, David Ignatius, uh, who's uh, one of the editors of the Post, and he came in to talk to me about Bush's communication style, which was always a landmine uh, for me to get into with a reporter. Um, but uh, his headline was, Press Corps to Bush, Manipulate Us. And what he was trying to reflect was that we were a more difficult uh, group to cover. We were a more difficult presidency to cover in his perspective because we weren't telling the press this is the one message of the day that you need to worry about and we're going to leverage all the activities of the day around that one message. My reaction to David Ignatius when he asked me about that was that's just not reality. The reality is that life is not so one-dimensional. It is much more complicated than that. And we feel comfortable that it's going to be a different kind of communication style. And so we shied away from stagecraft, sometimes in, to our peril. Sometimes it was, uh, I think, uh, very advantageous to allowing the natural communications uh, to take place. In 1992, um, uh, some of my colleagues who are in the back of the room will remember this, um, we had a history of recognizing sports teams that had won championships. That was a, something the president does. And uh, we had done that for the previous several years. And in 1992, the uh, Americans won the Ryder Cup. And the president was very excited about the fact that the, pre that the Americans had won the Ryder Cup. It was a big golf event. And he sent a little note to the scheduling office that said, when are we going to have the Ryder Cup folks come in? And those of us who worked on scheduling you know, events and so forth sort of got very uncomfortable and said, you know, the economy is in the tank. Probably not the best visual is for the president to be out there kind of hobnobbing with a bunch of rich golfers. That was our kind of perspective. So we sort of ignored his request. And uh, a little while later, another note comes down to the scheduling office saying, hey, oh, hey, how about those Ryder Cup guys? When are the Ryder Cup guys coming in? And so we cleverly decided that what we would do, we'd do an event. We couldn't avoid doing an event. We'd do an event, and it would be uh, a stills only, no speech event. And what that means is that we would have still photography only, so no TV cameras, and there would be no speech, and then the president would go down to a little putting green down at the, uh, on the south lawn somewhere and just, you know, play golf with these guys, and we'd kind of take care of it that way. The day of the event, uh, the president's secretary called me, and asked me to come down to see the president. That's always a nerve-wracking experience just in itself because you are never told why you're coming to the, see the president. And so you have all these, okay, what could it possibly be? So I got in there and he said, uh, hey, I see that the Ryder Cup uh, uh, champions are coming in. Yes, sir. He says, I, uh, I also see that it's a stills only event. Yes, sir. Uh, Dave, let, let me just add, didn't we do a big Rose Garden event for the NCAA basketball champs? I did a speech. I said, yes, sir. And didn't we do a big event for when the uh, Toronto Blue Jays won the uh, World Series? And didn't I do a big speech about that? Mm, yes, sir. And he said, and didn't when the women's lacrosse champs won? <laughs> didn't I do an event and a speech with that? Yes, sir. And then he got a very kind of stony look on his face. And he said, let me guess. You don't want, you, you, I don't know if he called us brainiacs, but it was something like that. You guys in the scheduling operation um, decided that maybe it wouldn't look too good if I was seen with a bunch of rich golfers, because that might betray my elitist uh, past. Is that it? Yes, sir. <laughs> and he said, I'll do it your way this time. 
but you go back and you tell all of your colleagues that I don't like it. And the reason he didn't like it was because he thought that was an offense to those Ryder Cup champions. And that was the humanity of George Bush coming through, where we might have had the right political solution in terms of how we managed from a media standpoint, but that really, to him, betrayed the idea of how you treat somebody that's coming to the White House. Well, anyway, I just wanted to just follow up on that. Please. I was fortunate enough to be in the pool uh, when President Bush went on his Thanksgiving visit to the Persian Gulf Theater before Desert Storm. And we had three moments with President Bush. One was uh, with the Navy, one was with the Marines, and one was with the Army. And I was with the Army moment. We went to a forward base. And, um, uh, and this is an example, I think, of this humanity, but this sense that it was very natural. When he did things like this, it came across beautifully because it reflected him. He was in a chow line, and the young spec five or whatever he was was serving him, and, and he was so nervous that he gave President Bush the completely wrong order. He wanted tea and he got coffee. He wanted macaroni and cheese and he got a steak. And so, but he didn't want to say anything and embarrass the kid. So. Uh, the kid said, well, thank you for coming, Mr. President. And President Bush said, and he was getting choked up, he said, thinking he was about to order these people into the combat, and said, well, no, um, I want to thank you for your service. And um, I always remember that famous line that I think of when I do moments like this, and you guys are the ones who are important, not me. And he said, as Woody Allen said, 90% of life is just showing up, and it was just that self-deprecation and that sense of down-to-earth guy that he was that, again, I don't think enough of that came out. But you that's know, the kind of thing that I think reflected him. On that, on that particular trip, uh, we had, there were actually four speeches because he did the Air Force first, mm -hmm. and then we did go to the Army and the Navy. We had to go out in the, in, on a ship to right. do a Thanksgiving service, and we went up right. to the Marines. And so we had four speeches ready to go. But like a lot of trips, uh, he saw those speeches late in the game. And so we had had a state dinner the night before in Jeddah. Uh, and it was very late. And so on the flight up to Dharan, he was looking at his speeches. And I had shown the speeches to General Schwarzkopf. And Schwarzkopf got choked up by the speeches. And we had a lot of very you know, uh, emotive things in these speeches, letters from parents and so forth. And I got called up to the front of Air Force One, and there's the president. And he said, Dave, what are you trying to do to me? And once again, I was seeing my career flash before me. <laughs> and I didn't really know what he was talking about. And he said, what are you trying to do to me? Again. And I'm now stammering and stuttering. And he said, has Schwarzkopf seen these speeches? And I said, yes, sir. And he got kind of choked up. And he looked at me, and he just looked at me. And I said, a little over the top, a little over the top. He said, Dave, I'm just, gonna, I'm just trying to get through today. And I hadn't recognized, nor had my speechwriters recognized, that the power of showing up, the power of just his presence there carried the message, and that we didn't need to have you know a 15 minute speech and so I spent the next two hours cutting and pasting those speeches down to about one third of their size but the speech writing process was always a delicate kind of interaction with him because on the one hand he did not want flowery language he didn't like a lot of high-blown rhetoric um, on the on the other hand he was a very good editor and he was a very good writer himself. And uh, the more I could encourage him to engage on a speech, I knew it was going to improve. The speech writing process, as you well know, and all of us here, I think, well know, the speech writing process in a White House is just dreadful. Um, it, is, uh, the, the, it, it goes by the axiom of there is no greater, you know, the, a, a speech gets circulated to a whole lot of people before it ever gets to the president. And the uh, axiom of there's no greater pleasure than to edit someone else's work is exactly what happens in the White House. <laughs> and so the job of, of the uh, communications guy is to try to keep some life to the speech before it gets totally watered down, before it even sees the president. <coughs> well, 
Um, as you can tell, we could go on and on uh, with more uh, illustrations, anecdotes, and stories about a president whom we feel fortunate in being able to serve and to cover. Please join me in thanking Nick Calio, Dave Demarest, Greg Petersmeyer, and Ken Walsh for this afternoon's panel.